We'll be working every week to uncover ways the system is broken, how people fall through the cracks, and what services are working. So far, we've collected about a dozen interviews, and we found a lot of people are talking about mental health, but people on the front lines tell us now it's time to do something. In kindergarten is when they wanted to expel them. Um, and so I knew something was pretty wrong. Um, it was not my koi. I mean, you could tell my koi cares about people. My koi cares about animals. This koi was not. Everyone has, at any point in time, will have a mental health problem. A person has a just a episodic uh, a problem, which probably most of us will have at uh, some period in our lives. Most people will. Most people will. Most people will. People have nowhere to go when they're in crisis in the community. We have people in the state of Michigan who basically live in the emergency room because there is no one to provide the supports that they need in the community. I didn't understand what was going on with me. And it was scary. And mental illness scares people. That word. Like in a three hour period, I heard three different attempted suicides. Statewide, there has got to be a huge solution. Oh, it's awful. I love, um, lately, it's been really bad loneliness. Is enough being done to treat mental illnesses? Nothing's being done. We've got a system that's not working. It's, it's broken. I think the biggest flaw is I, I, the pause makes me feel like there's so many, but it's hard to pinpoint. They just sort of treat me differently. It makes me feel like unwanted and that nobody really cares apart from my family. For one medication, $250, I was like, I can't do it. The things that are helping him would go away. That must be scary. Very much so. Um, <sighs> we are not covering um, everyone that really needs specialty services, and that's sad. What are we doing about it? Well, I'm talking to you. People are talking to us in hopes this series, State of Mind, will be a call to action. 911 dispatchers are the link to help when you need it the most. It's a traumatic and high-stress job. In fact, studies show the work takes a real toll on dispatchers' mental health. In tonight's State of Mind, News Channel 3 I-Team reporter Rachel Glazer takes you inside 911 call centers to find out how their mental health can impact your safety. 911, what's the your emergency? Imagine listening to a death by suicide. Panic, violence, children crying, a person's last breath while their loved one begs for more time. We're hearing the screams for help but we're not able to do anything. Oh my God, help. Okay. The emotion in the caller's voice mentally transports 911 dispatcher Jennifer Hemminger to the scene. Is she changing color? On average, a call comes into Van Buren County Central Dispatch every two and a half minutes. Is she breathing? Uh, yes, barely. The caller's friend is unconscious. We're gonna go ahead and start CPR, okay? While you're in it, just kind of go through the motions. You ask the questions, you get the responses, and you react accordingly. I'm going to tell you how to do chest compressions, okay? Seconds matter when lives are on the line. One, two, three, four, five, six. It's after the call that you have the problems. That you sit there and you think, now could I have done something different? Research shows dispatchers can experience post-traumatic stress disorder just as much as other first responders. You just suck it up and deal with it. You take the next call because somebody else is going to need help. Need medical attention? Yep, you do what you got to do, and then when everything's said and done, there are sometimes some calls make you cry. Then the phone rings again. Kalamazoo Dispatch Authority, this is Vicki. About every 96 seconds at the Kalamazoo County Consolidated Dispatch Authority, Jeff Troyer is the executive director. Not only do we train in stress management, but you have to have uh, internal programs available um, and you have to work together. A 
A first-of-its-kind study finds 911 dispatchers experience suicidal thoughts at a rate more than double the general population. At some point, they say, you know, I just can't take another phone call. I can't dispatch another police officer to this. I just, my bucket's full. To offset high turnover and burnout rates, Tim Marshall teaches dispatchers stress resilience. We need to be able to bring more people in and have more funding so that we're staffed at the levels where they can handle the call volume and not be impacted so, so deeply personally by this. We have help in route for you. Okay, do not stop. Imagine that you're the, now the dispatcher. Oh, call after call after call, if these kinds of things happen, could that impact their performance over time? Sure it could. I know you're getting tired. You gotta go a little bit faster though, okay? For 10 minutes, the dispatcher coaches a caller on how to perform CPR. Then, Help her on. You did a great job. Thank you. Bye. Most calls end with no resolution for dispatchers. Not knowing if the patient lived, if they died, um, if they even made it out of the house. It's really tough. Hemminger says sometimes the mental picture and the assumed outcome can be worse than reality. Disappointing harvest, more debt. All of those things combined with depression can leave farmers considering suicide. In tonight's State of Mind, News Channel 3's Mike Kravesick investigates the growing problem of farmers committing suicide. Farmers are the backbone of Michigan's economy. The food and agriculture industry contributes more than $100 billion each year to the state's economy. But farmers work long hours, often for diminishing returns. Many struggle with issues out of their control and some don't know where to turn for help. Day in and day out, you'll find Bridget Leach. I tell people that, that I'm either wet, dirty, hot, sweaty, something here. all the time. Um, not everything in here is beautiful because it's towards the end of the season. Working on her family-owned farm just outside of Kalamazoo. You want red ones or green ones? I kind of like these green ones. This time of year, she brings her vegetable crops to harvest. You see where it's been so wet that we've had, this is mildew issue. But the weather hasn't been kind lately. Now this should be a happy time of year. You know, we should be excited. And that's just the beginning of the problem. It's that constant pressure of knowing that you owe that much money. And how are you gonna get, how are you gonna make sure that you can pay the bank back? But at some point, there's a tipping point where you can't cope with it anymore. She's not alone. There's so many different stressors that are uh, involved in, in farming. You know, they can't control the weather. They can't control the commodity prices, uh, the ups and downs and dairies. And I think all of those things are kind of compacting, uh, compounding the issues and really become making it more and more prevalent. Experts say those stressors are leading many farmers to commit suicide. A recent CDC study shows farmer suicide rates are 23% higher than the general population. And if they feel isolated, if they have feelings of hopelessness and helplessness, uh, those can contribute to those states. And begin to notice any thoughts that might be entering. Mental health counselor. Breathing and just watching your breath relax. Charlene Brown sees the struggle firsthand. People have stress, they don't know how to manage those feelings, and then they get into this cycle of trying to push away those feelings or those thoughts, which just adds on to the other stressors of just being in the profession. Brown says farmers are often reluctant to ask for help. Because it's really about a lineage. It's like this generation has built this lineage and then with the stress that they are under, not only are they letting themselves down, but this lineage of their family name that they're letting down. That family lineage drives Bridget Leach. Her family farm goes back generations. I'd look at the numbers and, and say, why, why are we doing this? It'd be a lot easier if the family legacy wasn't involved. In bad times, she finds herself unable to walk away. I owe it to the people who came before me, and I owe it to the people who will come after. Mental health puts a serious strain on county jails, and the cost often falls on taxpayers. In this week's State of Mind, the I team takes us inside local jails. A News Channel 3's investigative reporter, Rachel Glazer, joins us in studio to explain the magnitude of the problem. 
Local sheriffs tell us it's like a switch flipped in the 70s when states started closing their psychiatric hospitals. Since then, jails have been under pressure to house inmates living with mental illness, and the numbers keep climbing along with the cost. This padded cell at the Van Buren County Jail houses inmates who are a danger to themselves or others. And most of the time it's for a severe mental disorder. There's only one like it at the jail. And how often is this occupied? Uh, honestly, usually on a daily basis. There's actually somebody in here before we brought you guys in here. We had to move them out. Um, once we get done shooting this video, then we'll move them right back in here. Video and audio surveillance monitors inmates locked in this cell. A corrections officer also stands outside the door around the clock. That's a lot of resources. A lot of resources. Van Buren County Sheriff Dan Abbott says monthly costs for mental health medications average $500 to $900 more per inmate than the general population. So ultimately, those are taxpayer dollars. Ultimately, it could be taxpayer dollars paying for this. Some people require um, an injection shot for their mental health disorder, and it varies from $265 to $650 for each shot once a month. Some require two shots a month. So if it's a $650 one, I mean, that's $1,300 every month just for one person. Now multiply that by several that's in our facility right now. It's astonishing. Right now, 22% of the jail's population is diagnosed with a mental health condition. Half of the inmates at the Kalamazoo County Jail have a dual diagnosis for mental health and substance abuse. A jail is not a place for somebody that's having uh, mental health issues because where do you put them? Sheriff Richard Fuller says the jail's medical wing also houses inmates with mental health conditions to keep up with the demand for space. We also know that people suffering a mental health issue are likely to be in jail longer than the average arrestee. So they're here longer, which puts them in a system that is not specifically designed for their mental health issues. It's designed for criminal justice. And just to show you what else we did. There's plexiglass on the bars in this eight-person cell in Van Buren County. Because on a regular basis, we're getting people there again with mental health disorders trying to hang themselves from the bars. So Abbott way, says no the jail tries to keep inmates living with mental health conditions separate from the general population. There are eight people in these four cells. Corrections officers tell us other inmates target people with mental illness to try to take their medication. Once they, they're released here, it falls back on them to get the treatment that they need. Abbott says it's like a revolving door. We see a lot of repeat offenders coming back, and it just falls right back to a lot of it is the, the mental health issue going on. Without enough state hospitals, local sheriffs tell us jails have to fill in the gap, often using taxpayer money. It's one of the reasons behind our State of Mind series, mental health impacts everyone. Active and recently retired Michigan corrections officers take their own lives at a rate about four times the general population. Just this past weekend, a retired corrections officer committed suicide. That's the fourth suicide by active and recently retired corrections officers in Michigan this year. In this week's State of Mind, I-Team reporter Andrew Feather digs into the daily challenges and mental health concerns this forgotten branch of law enforcement faces and asks state lawmakers what they're doing to help. Corrections officers I talk to call it a crisis. They say every day they go to work fearing they'll hear the worst about a colleague. The Michigan Department of Corrections is taking steps to improve employee mental health. But those on the inside worry about whether it will be enough. These are the ones I've seen a prisoner um, stabbed with one of these. Going in, Carrie Johnson knew being a corrections officer is a tough job. That's held true after 24 years of patrolling the cell blocks of the G. Robert Cotton Correctional Facility in Jackson. We're expected to be tough guys. What she didn't know was what would make the job so tough. I can um, deal with prisoner stuff. Um, it's the other stuff. The other stuff, things like PTSD, depression, and anxiety, are common among the more than 12,000 employees in the Michigan Department of Corrections. A study commissioned by the department this year found thousands of employees dealing with mental health challenges. One in six employees are estimated to meet the criteria for major depressive disorder. One in four show signs of PTSD. 
and about half have anxiety issues. For many, the mental health challenges become too much and they see no way out. Since 2017, I've had four suicides at my facility alone. One of those suicides, 45-year-old Michael Perdue, hit Johnson the hardest. He and I um, both came into work um, every day around the same time. And in this, this particular day, he says, do you have a second? And I said, give me a call, because we were kind of late. And um, I, said, I said, yeah, give me a call. And he says, okay. And he never called. Purdue was a 25-year veteran of the Department of Corrections and father of nine when he was found dead in his truck. His death ruled a suicide. He was who we looked to to uplift us and to, to think for one second that he was struggling in any way was so shocking to me because he was the person that was telling me to keep my chin up. Every time the honor guard comes to Cotton, remembering a fallen brother or sister, it becomes harder and harder to keep her chin up. I have a list of officers that I'm worried about. Does it scare you that you have to have that list? Yes, um, it does. Uh, I'm, I try to be conscientious of it so that I don't say, sure, call me, and that never happens. It's a tragedy corrections officers in Michigan are going through at an alarming rate. According to the Michigan Corrections Organization, 17 active and retired corrections officers in Michigan completed suicide since 2015. The Department of Corrections study found at least 34 more officers are planning to take their own lives. It's a lot more. It's difficult. It is, it is, it's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Unfortunately, I wasn't surprised. The Department of Corrections tapped Lynn Gorski to lead a new employee wellness unit. Father God, I ask that you watch over each one of these officers as they report to their respective facilities. The unit officially launched in May after months of planning. Gorski worked on a similar program with Michigan State Police for nearly a decade. Johnson says a proposed peer-to-peer -peer support network appeals most to the men and women she works with. The most important thing that they can do is to keep the actual boots on the ground officers in the conversation um, if they want to even crack the surface. Do you think the Michigan Department of Corrections is doing enough right now? The men and women that I work with are skeptical. Gorski says she's more than up to the challenge because when lives could be on the line, failure is not an option. But to know that there's, there were three individuals even just this year who made a choice to take their own life and didn't feel that they could reach out, that alone, that's why this program has to succeed. It has to be in place. Millions of Michiganders live in areas where there are not enough mental health care providers. In tonight's State of Mind report, the News Channel 3 I team examines a new concept in psychiatric care. Investigative reporter Rachel Glazer shows us how it works. When you're not physically sick enough to go to the emergency room, but you can't wait for an appointment to see your primary care doctor, there's urgent care centers. Now that same idea is now being applied to an urgent care center for psychiatric needs. There's a, a huge demand now being met, but experts say it's not the long-term solution. Every day you wake up and your mind wants to give up. Your brain just wants to go. Dennis Helmer lives uh, with mental illness. Live or die. Anxiety, really depression, and bipolar disorder. And the rest of you is going, come on, fight this. You can do this. He can and he does with the help of medication. Without it, Helmer says he's not himself. When I wasn't medicated, I would literally just go from one emotion to the next. It was either extreme high or extreme low. Nothing in between. The Kaiser Family Foundation reports more than 4.2 million Michiganders live in areas where there's a shortage of mental health care providers. In Ionia County, Helmer's one of them. I could go see a psychiatrist way out in Lansing or East Lansing, and even then they're like, well, we're booking six months out. The wait for help can leave him with no choice but to go to the emergency room for refills on his prescriptions. They didn't need to be um, in the hospital, and many of them didn't need to be assessed in an emergency room. Um, so we thought, well, there has to be something in between. In Grand Rapids, Pine Rest Psychiatric Urgent Care Center creates an in-between space. Mental health help for people who can't wait for an appointment but don't need to be hospitalized. 
Megan Zambiasi is the director. There really um, isn't anything else quite like this in our community or really even in the region. The psychiatric urgent care center is on track to see eight to 9,000 patients in its first year. There's a psychiatric provider who will come in and assess the person, evaluate the symptoms, and try to figure out what, what the next step should be. Treatment options include outpatient and inpatient care. Getting to people faster was um, probably the most important thing. Providers can write prescriptions and help patients set up follow-up care for ongoing treatment. Is there then a wait for the follow-up care? Or there, there is some time. Zambiasi says the urgent psychiatric care center fills a huge void for short-term care. I lost a friend. But it does not solve the shortage of mental health care providers. He couldn't find a psychiatrist to see him. Unless you, you have a mental disorder and you can feel that pain, you don't understand. Now, the rising suicide rate among veterans shows that trauma can be deadlier even than war. In this week's State of Mind, the News Channel 3 I-Team explores the challenges that veterans face when they try to find mental health help. Our investigative reporter, Rachel Glazer, uncovers a struggle to find understanding. It's therapy for me. Strokes of color across the canvas clear Otis Wilson's clouded head. All the other thoughts and stuff that I went through on my end, those are gone. A veteran of the U.S. Navy, Wilson volunteers in the art therapy department at Battle Creek's VA Medical Center. I've seen a lot of my friends who have participated in the program. Some of them end up killing themselves. The latest numbers from the Department of Veterans Affairs show in 2017 more than 6,000 veterans died by suicide, 170 in Michigan. Partially because when they seek help, a lot of people don't seem to understand them. Physically, emotionally, and mentally scarred, veterans return from war to fight an often silent battle at home. He was really struggling with not being able to sleep, flashbacks, nightmares, um, garbage on the road, sending him back to Iraq. Tina Thompson met her future husband, Kevin, in his first week's home from a nine-month deployment. Despite having many years of social work education and being trained to help people, um, I had absolutely no preparation on how to help a combat vet. Five different therapists tried. Even within the, the world of, of the VA, we ran into a lot of, a lot of people who were there to help uh, but weren't necessarily very understanding or empathetic. To build a better understanding, Thompson runs the Combat Veterans Certificate Program at MSU's School of Social Work. Veterans teach students how to better serve veterans in the first and only academic program of its kind. Healing is what is really needed by so many veterans who are still struggling despite years and years of going through treatment. Ten years into his battle at home, Marine Corps veteran Kevin Thompson made a plan to end his life. The same day, this family photo was taken. That I had a, uh, a breakdown in the uh, kitchen floor and I had the very same laptop I think I have right now in my hand. Help came by way of a counselor who understood him best, a fellow veteran. Well, this guy's missing an arm and a leg. You know, I, I was quite embarrassed because my injuries are not like theirs. Mine is just I'm weak inside, I guess. Now he's a counselor at a veteran's center in the UP. Whoa, that's a better feeling than the destructive part of me that I was taught to be. No one does more for veterans. Wilson's steady hand paints the words across his American flag painting. He extends the other to veterans in need of understanding. We can all trust each other because we know each other to be. There's only one state-run psychiatric hospital for children in Michigan. And right now, the state is helping close to 600 kids with serious emotional disturbances as they transition out of the hospital. This week, the News Channel 3 I-Team announced a new series that aims to uncover cracks in our mental health system. Rachel Glazer joins us now in studio with a flaw that's put one family in an impossible situation. Mental health officials tell us the people who tend to fall through the cracks make just a little bit too much money to qualify for Medicaid. Now, there are other ways to access the state's Medicaid program, but the services that aim to help kids can be taken away if a child becomes too stable. You'll be living in a war zone, but you cannot tell friend from foe. Song lyrics express the emotions Coy Peterson struggles to so, speak. You're the enemy, so stay away from us. This is too much. At 14, he lives with anxiety, depression, ADHD, sleep, and mood disorders. We were playing with medication, and we were on the wrong one for a long time, and he was 
actually pretty scary. Um, it was not my koi. I mean, you could tell. My koi cares about people. My koi cares about animals. Um, this koi was not. Then Corey Peterson says she got her son back at a cost she couldn't afford. We were looking at almost $900 a month. That's with private insurance. Just for one medication, $250. I was like, I can't do it. Now she doesn't have to. Medicaid covers the cost of Koi's medication. These are a month's worth. Koi gets the waiver for children with serious emotional disturbance. It gives families with private insurance access to Michigan's Medicaid plan and community-based services. SED waivers are for children who would otherwise qualify for inpatient services. So it's to keep children out of the psychiatric that's hospital. That's correct, if that's possible. Jeff Patton is CEO of Kalamazoo Community Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. The organization helps families apply for waivers and access programs like at-home music therapy, which is what Koi says helps him the most. So if it all goes away, he's probably going to be hospitalized um, because I think that's what's holding them together right now. That must be scary. Very much so. Um, Her fear is Koi is doing so well, the state won't renew his waiver. Now that could be an issue. That, uh, that could be a legitimate concern. Uh, when people are improving, uh, they, don't, they don't qualify for the more extensive types of services. SED waivers are only available in 37 of Michigan's 83 counties. State health officials tell us the waiver can serve up to 969 kids. This year, the state approved waivers for about 600 children. The system is broken in that sense, that we are not covering um, everyone that really needs special services, and that's sad. Without the waiver, Peterson says another option is she or her husband quit their job. That would lower their household income to get on Medicaid. You know, just he wants it normal, and he doesn't seem to see an end where it ever will be. You know, he has hopes and dreams. He wants to get married, he wants to have kids, he wants to be a rock star. So, um, when he talks about killing himself, it's, it's probably one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with. Anticipating the waiver will expire in October, Coy is trying out less expensive medications. His mom says they're not as effective. It makes me feel like unwanted and that Nobody really cares apart from my family.